Welcome everyone to the first inaugural annual gathering of the Good Business Charter members. Uh, I'm Miata Fambola, I'm Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation and one of the trustees of the Good Business Foundation, which is the charity that operates the charter. We are quite an incredible milestone. Uh, the Good Business Charter now has 1,000, over 1,000 accredited organizations. Um, from a range of different sectors and of a range of different sizes. And if I think about how far we have moved in such a short space of time, I think it's a huge testimony to the team behind this and a huge testimony to all of you. So we wanted to bring everyone together. Uh, firstly, to say a huge thank you. Um, thank you and a massive congratulations for being part of this growing movement of businesses and organizations that are pushing and championing responsible business, but also to hear from some of the amazing examples on the ground of how this is being put into practice. So we're gonna split the conversation into two parts. We've round a lot in, uh, so this is hopefully gonna be a really exciting, engaging and stimulating hour. But the first part, we'll take a bit of an overview, look at the bigger picture, why we're all here, what we're all part of, what it is that we're trying to do and achieve and why it is that we're doing it. And then the second part of the conversation will take the perspective from the ground, from examples of businesses and organizations that are putting this in practice in pretty challenging times. Then we'll create the space uh, for questions, for answers, for us to have a conversation. Uh, so I will kick off uh, firstly with Julian Richer, who uh, was the brainchild behind this, uh, the founder um, of the charter. And then we'll move on to Francis O'Grady, who many of you know, uh, the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, and to Tony Danker. And they will give us the overview from the top, and then I'll hand over to uh, Jenny, who will introduce herself, introduce the work that we're doing, and introduce uh, the second session. Julian, over to you. Thank you, Miata. Well, I'm sorry there's been a bit of a misunderstanding today. I thought I was talking for five hours. Apparently they've only given me five minutes. So I'm going to have to speak real quick. Anyway, thank you all for joining today. Great to see you. And thank you for your involvement if you've been involved already. Capitalism's um, 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 got a terrible reputation uh, for its bad behaviour, but it also can be a force for good. Going through history for hundreds, if not thousands of years, has been responsible for uh, uh, slavery and exploitation and abuse and pollution and colonialism. Absolutely ghastly. But it can be a force for good in terms of the goods and services that we use. We uh, enjoyed, dare I say, even love. It can provide decent jobs. And of course, we need it to raise taxes to support the state. So as I see it, the challenge is to differentiate between good and bad capitalism. I've not, I've read a few books on the subject, and I've not found a better system that stood the test of time. So we're stuck with it, whether we like it or not, but let's make it good capitalism. Um, interestingly, um, um, and then I thought, uh, I wrote a book about this, but I'm more of a doer than a writer. Uh, and I wanted to do something um, I'm non-party political, but the government weren't really interested in doing much about this. We need much tougher rules, I believe. We'd have anarchy on a football pitch in 30 seconds if we didn't have rules. And the taxation uh, system is a joke. Too much. Uh, anyway, let's not get into that. I've only got five minutes. So um, um, what we need to do is differentiate between good and bad. And uh, I thought we needed an accreditation system, a signpost, if you like, to direct people to good capitalism, because I believe consumers cared about this, particularly through COVID. We've seen horrendous abuse. We saw the, the overcrowded sweatshops in the Midlands, people dying uh, through the lousy conditions. They weren't even on a minimum wage. So this is not a historic issue by capitalism. This is with us today. And people are sick of it, and they're looking for a better way. So recently, funny enough, the, the TSB confirmed what I thought. 97%, they did a survey, a survey, 97% of the public want to spend their money with good businesses. The problem is they don't know who they are because the bad guys don't say, you know, don't come here, we're rotten, we don't pay our taxes. So I felt we needed an independent third party way. I did a, a lunch with Simon Fox. He, he wanted to help. I said, right, you can be chair then. And he's amazing. I can see he's on the call. And he got us in with the CBI. I thought um, um, they wouldn't be interested, but they were. Dame Karen was very supportive. I went out a cup of tea with Francis and she said in so many words, good luck with that then. But she was supportive and put Tim Sharp, who's here today as well, on our board. So we had the, the biggest organisations uh, across parties supporting us from day one. And they've been really involved from the beginning. It's been a joy to see them work together so well uh, and made me very proud. So how does it work? What is it? Um, OK, so there are two bits about it which are really easy. It's really quick to join from an admin point of view. It's less than an hour because we're all busy, right? It's also really, really cheap because my wife and I fund the whole thing. It's heavily subsidised, free to sign up, free the first year and second year. Uh, we ask for a tiny bit of skin in the game. 
Okay, so it's the best investment base that you're ever going to make because the return on it is fantastic. Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. But it's really hard to join because we've got 10 components. They're non-negotiable. We figured we couldn't give you a, a organizations a pass mark of five out of 10 because we couldn't have people saying, oh, well, we pay our bills promptly, but we don't pay the living wage. That's not on. We want to have credibility as a, a, as a brand with integrity for consumers. So it's a high bar, but we've got a thousand organizations who want to join us, which is fantastic. So that's why we... Um, 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 we think that's really, really, really important. Now, let me just talk a bit about this. Long before the Good Business Charla, I always tried to treat my colleagues well, who I work with, and treat our customers well. And I'm in a ferociously difficult sector. Let me just check the time. Okay, I've got four and a half hours left. Okay, really ferociously difficult sector. Okay, and we've stood the test of time through decades and been reasonably successful. And I'm really proud of that. And I absolutely put it down to uh, the way we, we do stuff. And the Good Business Charla is all about that. Now, I mean, good... I meet people who think they're running good businesses and they tick seven or eight boxes. So if we can move thousands of businesses across the country to tick all 10, we'll have a better society, I believe, uh, and I think they'll be better off as well. So we're really excited about this. The, um, the Good Business Charter is a signpost uh, to good organisations. It's open to charities and the public sector as well. It's recognition for people that do things well. There are five and a half million companies in the country. 99.9% .9 of the, those companies uh, um, have got less than 250 workers, okay? SMEs, they're called, as you know. Uh, and the great majority of them are people working hard, decent people trying to make an honest buck. And um, normally it's the monsters that get written about in the press. We want there to be more. Um, this will, we, we, we notice already, we know from members who sign up, they do a press release and they get fantastic local press because the public want this to happen. They're very, very supportive. So when I say it's a fantastic investment, you know, for, for, for nothing to sign up to getting great local press about the good work you're doing, is a fantastic thing. So not only do you get recognition, just check the timing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 20 seconds left. Not only do you get re great recognition, but it will drive customers to your door. And that is an absolute win-win. So please, please, please come and join us. Spread the word. Uh, this could be um, a great thing in the years to come. Thank you very much. Francis, over to you. Thanks very much, Mieta. Thank you, Mieta, for all the brilliant work you've done over the years, especially with NEF. We've worked closely. And thanks to Julian as well, who is, as we've just heard, a force of nature. Um, and, you know, the work that we've done together on tax avoidance, uh, tackling that, um, on zero hours contracts, which, you know, is in the vast majority of cases, a massive scandal that needs to be dealt with. We're really, really appreciative of that work. Last night, I was at um, a rally and lobby of parliament around the cost of living crisis, but really thousands of workers coming together saying, we want decent work. That's what it was about at its heart. And I have to say, that's what motivates me around supporting this charter. And, you know, we all know about what happened during the pandemic and those millions of key workers and the sense of betrayal, real betrayal, that many of them feel that they were appreciated during the pandemic. People found out for the first time how important their labour was. And now they feel nothing's happened as a result. It's back to same old, same old. In fact, yesterday, the TUC showed that one in five kids in key worker families live in poverty and that begins to make sense when you think about for example social care workers where the majority of them are on less than 10 pounds an hour many of them on insecure contracts of employment so you know something is wrong and i think there is a new mood in the country i'm picking this up i go around the country a lot uh, you know, people are much more aware about who's paying their fair share of tax and which uh, big multinational corporations are not, in many people's views, paying their fair share compared to, say, small businesses or ordinary workers. What's happening with boardroom pay? How come profits are doing so well when investment and growth seem so poor? And you know, if I could tell you some of the conversations I've had around trickle down economics in plain language, I won't do it because it, you know, amongst ordinary working people, there is some very plain uh, definitions of what they think that means. Um, so I think that makes uh, 
the charter even more important. Uh, and those concrete commitments, those 10 concrete commitments, absolutely invaluable. So really just literally three quick points for me. The first is that this is about enlightened self-interest, you know, way back to the beginning uh, of industrialization. It's always been a case of uh, good employers standing up because they don't want to be undercut by the bad. You know, so it's doing the right thing, but it's also there's a material self-interest. Otherwise, we end up in that spiral going down to the bottom. And all the, you know, contemporary evidence is that those companies who treat workers fairly, who engage them, who recognize representatives, who pay a decent wage, they are the most successful companies. So it's good for all of us. It's really good for all of us. Secondly, Again, I would say one of the most important commitments is around a stronger voice. Uh, you know, that really, I can't tell you how much it matters. You know, for all the talk about pay, which is real at the moment, there is also a huge conversations about people feeling respected at work. And in order to feel respected, you need to feel listened to. And that means, you know, representatives, people speaking for you. Uh, you know, for the TUC, obviously, it's no secret. We would like uh, reform of corporate governance so that there was worker representation on boards. You know, this is commonplace, as you know, in many countries. We'd like to see that here, too. But we'd also like to see the spread of collective bargaining. And again, I was in Madrid recently talking to government ministers and union leaders. They've introduced a whole new package of labour standard, uh, standards reforms, including the so-called riders law, where you know, their equivalent of delivery drivers, automatically employees, um, automatically with all those rights that come with being an employee and the opportunity to organise themselves. They were queuing up literally at union offices to join a union. You know, I, I find that really inspiring and I think decent employers understand the importance of that too. And then thirdly, just to state the obvious, we face such huge challenges as a country from artificial intelligence to net zero, uh, to Brexit and trade agreements, big, big challenges. Uh, and politically too, and again, this hope I'm not being controversial here, Nobody knows when the next general election will be. There is no guarantee of what the outcome will be. But what I will say is that we have a Labour Party uh, that currently in the polls looks like it's going to be the next government with very clear commitments to guaranteed hours for workers, to fair pay agreements, to repealing anti-union laws, and to an industrial strategy council on which unions and employers will be represented together. So I think there's a fantastic opportunity for decent employers to be on the front foot in anticipation of some of those big changes and an opportunity for a new relationship between unions and employers so that we all face the future together for that fairer, greener Britain. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, Tony, uh, Director General of the CBI, can't be with us in person, but we've got a message from him, uh, which we will play now. Hello, I'm Tony Denker. I'm the Director General of the CBI, and I'm completely thrilled. Uh, that everybody is getting together for the inaugural uh, meeting of signatories of the Good Business Charter. I'm so sorry I can't be there for personal reasons, but I and we at the CBI have been centrally involved with the foundation of the Good Business Charter, supporting Julian's fantastic initiative and in supporting its work and uh, helping convince all of you uh, to be signatories as we are. Look, it couldn't be more important. We've had an incredible realization really these past few weeks and months of the scale of the economic challenge facing the people of the United Kingdom and the businesses of the United Kingdom. We are, let's face it, entering uh, incredibly difficult times, a real risk of uh, perhaps even a certainty of stagflation in our economy, households badly hit, businesses badly hit by the energy crisis. 
And so it really falls upon us as business leaders to think about the kind of economy we're trying to build and the kind of firms we're trying to build. Now, one of the things I worry about most is a growing divisiveness in society, a growing divisiveness in a politics, a divisiveness that says, you know, whilst people are really struggling, businesses over here are just, you know, making profits, getting rich, etc. Whereas, in fact, the opposite is true. In my experience, the best businesses are at the forefront of a helping their employees and their customers and the small businesses in their supply chain managing inflation, managing uh, the cost of living crisis. We are also as businesses at the forefront of growth and sustainable growth. There's no doubt that for me, uh, green growth is not only morally an imperative for the survival of the planet, it's actually Britain's biggest economic hope. It is the growth market that can power a 2.5% growth rate in our economy in the long term. So I think actually what the Good Business Charter signifies is exactly uh, what we all uh, need to be aligning around in the months and years to come. It shows that the country, its businesses, its communities, its unions, its people are entirely aligned on the economy we're trying to build. Growth is an absolute imperative and growth that includes everybody in our society to get through these difficult times is an imperative too. That's why I'm completely thrilled that we at the CBI continue to be involved with Julian and everybody in the Good Business Charter. Uh, congratulations on this milestone, and let's keep building more milestones in the months and years to come. I like all the silent clapping I can see going on. Uh, a warm welcome to you all. My name is Jenny Herrera. I'm the CEO of the Good Business Charter. Those of you who are accredited organisations hopefully see newsletters from me and are familiar with me. Those who have perhaps come along today invited by one of our members. Uh, it, it's wonderful to have you here and we just wanted to open this up so that people could see a bit more about what the Good Business Charter is about uh, and where we're coming from. I'm just going to um, do a bit of muting because there's a little bit of background noise going on. Yeah. Uh, so as you've seen, we launched the Good Business Charter in partnership with the TUC and the CBI, and that's just been an amazing way to establish the fact that we are seeking out the voices of the workers and the voices of businesses. Another real game changer for us over the last two and a half years was partnering with the Federation of Small Businesses. And so in January of 2021, we launched with them the streamlined version, which is specifically for businesses and charities and any other organizations with 50 employees or less. We changed the wording. We're really pleased with the result because we changed the wording in a way that was more accessible to small businesses. However, it is just as robust as the bigger one. It just fits what small businesses need. And when we launched that, we have been able to really see that growth through the small businesses. Julian's heart, our heart has been that this works for all sizes and sector. And, and I think, you know, that's the really key thing as we look at it. It's like, it's amazing to see it growing amongst the small businesses. We need it to be growing amongst the big businesses, growing in different sectors, because, and if, if you're in a sector where you say, I don't think this works for us, my question is, help me understand why. Why not? What needs to change? So that we can really ensure that we're listening to each sector because our heart is to have something that works so that members of the general public, consumers, potential employees in a market where we know that it can be difficult to harness talent, to be able to have those opportunities to explain how you are a responsible business, what you're doing around our 10 components. The Institute of Directors was our 1000th member back in March, another key organisation that we're just really excited to be working with and hopeful of many more opportunities. And we are a small team, we're a small charity and we, for us, the key is to lean into these different networks, look at ways both in the round with membership organisations and trade associations, but around specific components as well, such as the Living Wage Foundation, the ETI, the Ethical Trading Initiative, Fair Tax Mark, all these different 
people who've been working in these areas for years, decades in some cases, and are far more expert than us. What we seek to do is accredit organisations and yes, build that community, but be able to signpost you to resources that are out there and just enthuse you. And that's really our heart today, to gather you together, to enthuse you about what is going on. Before I introduce our businesses and pass on to them, I also just want to touch briefly on the place-based model, which was another direction of travel we have taken over the last two years. So in June 2021, York became our first GBC city which means that the council, the NHS Trust, both universities and Aviva, a big employer here in York, all became accredited by the GBC to then championing it as at a place level and really encourage many businesses. We've already got almost 100 businesses in York uh, accredited by the GBC. But also it's been great to just see the way that it's become part and parcel of, of how York communicates its growth, its, its attention to how it's caring for workers, the importance of all these different aspects. And so we're really excited about this model. We are in conversation with various other councils or universities about how it can be replicated elsewhere. And, and just to, to throw that out really at this stage, if you're in an area where you're like, oh, actually this could be something where our organization sort of gets together with some others and talks to the local council and looks at ways to embed it in a place-based model. Uh, there, I think there's a lot of potential for that. So that's enough for me at the moment, just to, I popped in the chat, but we, uh, I will be taking questions uh, through the chat to me. So if you have any questions, do put them through and, and I'll be going through them while our businesses share uh, before we hand over to some time of questions. We really wanted to hear from some businesses, a variety of businesses, just to, to show you how they are uh, making use of the GBC and, and what they're doing as a responsible business. We want you to go away equipped with some ideas as well of what you might think about doing. So we are going to hear from four different businesses. Schroeder's Personal Wealth, Richer Sounds, Prompts and Bicycles and The Trampery. So we're going to start off with Joel Ripley, who's the FD at Schroeder's Personal Wealth, who's going to share a little bit about what the GBC means for them there. Thank you, Jenny. And good morning, everybody, just from uh, down the road uh, in Leeds. Um, so Schroeder's Personal Wealth, we are a financial advice and investment management company. We operate in a highly regulated and fiercely competitive part of the financial services sector. One of the characteristics of the sector we operate in, IFA's financial advice, is very sadly that we have quite a weak reputation. It's a sector that's been tarnished with a poor track record of mis-selling scandals like mortgage endowments and terrible conduct by rogue advisors, most recently the scandal around the British uh, steel pensions. In order to succeed, we have set out to differentiate ourselves against the competition and to bring something new to the sector. We have put responsibility right at the core of what we do, the very heart of everything we do. Our strategy is based around the core value of being responsible. Responsible in how we interact with our clients, how we interact with our colleagues, the communities in which we operate and the environment. And the very good news we're finding is that this is a hugely successful strategy and that our business is being able to thrive despite the obviously very difficult times we're in and the very difficult markets which directly affect our sector. What I wanted to do in the next couple of minutes is just touch very briefly on two things that we've done to support our accreditation under the GBC in both 2021 and this year, 2022. So firstly, transparency. In order to become accredited, we had to adapt our business model. We had to change some of the ways that we did, new, did business and introduce some new business practices and policies in order to make sure that we complied with the GBC's 10 core components. But we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to be open and transparent in the way that we've done that. And so we decided to publish an annual responsible business report in which we report our commitments to our communities, our clients, our colleagues. And we also talk openly about areas where we think we've got an opportunity to improve and we transparently disclose everything we can about our business from the living wage through to the way that we pay our taxes. This transparency has been an incredible boon for our business. 
It's proved to be a useful tool with our advisors and it's helped us to win business from clients who are wondering about why they should do business with us. The second area I wanted to talk about was taxation. You know, the very core of our business is giving financial advice. Advice about personal tax is usually central to the advice that we give our clients. But our advice can only ever be responsible, legal, ethical and reputationally sound. It's absolutely mission critical to us that our corporate position is to the same high standards that we ask of our advisors. To do this, we've undergone the full scrutiny of the Fair Tax Foundation, and we today proudly bear the fair tax mark for our responsible tax conduct. I think I'm right in saying we're only one of only two firms that give financial advice who hold this, and we're certainly one of the biggest. You know, Francis talked about earlier on the importance of corporation tax. And this is one of the biggest issues that customers care about. The Institute of Business Ethics survey this this year found that the level of public disquiet about corporate tax avoidance is at a record high. 47% of the public described it as their top concern about UK business. But we also looked deeply into the study by the Institute of Business Ethics and there was another finding in there. It found that 75% of customers would rather shop at or be employed by a business that could prove they pay their fair share of tax. That is what we have done. And our conclusion is simply that the responsible business conduct and GBC accreditation is a fantastic force for good. Our finding is that responsibility is not a cost. It is a massive opportunity for our businesses. And we would very much like to commend it to everyone in the community that we deal with. Thanks, Jenny. Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. And a huge thanks from us for Schroeder's Personal Wealth and all that they've done to just show how to embed the Good Business Charter and make us appreciate the importance of then teaching the other members about different ways that they can really embed what the GBC stands for and the way that you've communicated it internally to your workforce and externally. So uh, there's a brilliant responsible business report that Schroeder's Personal Wealth have done, which uh, we can perhaps circulate to you later. Great, now I'm gonna hand over to Julie Abraham, who's CEO at Richer Sounds. Hi, thanks, Jenny. Um, I wanted to touch upon, and I'm, I'm conscious time is short, but I can't speak as fast as Julian. But we've been in a business, as Julian said, we've been in business now for over 40 years in a sector, a retail sector that has uh, low margins and very competitive. Um, but also historically, retail in general has been known for um, poorly paid uh, workers. Um, but we have been successful because we have followed what we think is morally right and, and, and good, for the, good for society. We've always paid above market rates. We've always paid well. Um, we've been proudly accredited by the Living Wage Foundation, I think, for over six years now. Um, we, as soon as the fair tax mark came out, we jumped on that. We do love a certificate and, a, and some accreditation. So, um, but what we found, and we advertise all of this, so it's on our website, and I would encourage everybody to do the same thing. Anything... Anything that's a good news story, customers love. Um, when we re-accredit for tax watch, uh, tax, sorry, the fair tax mark, it goes out on Twitter and we get so much engagement from customers. Um, the colleagues love the, living, you know, the fact we're accredited by the Living Wage Foundation um, and, and that's proven in our staff retention rates. They are so good for the retail sector and that is a huge benefit to the company as a whole and to our customers. It means we've got well-trained, knowledgeable colleagues um, that can do a good job. They want to do a good job because they know we look after them. And that then translates into more customers because they know we look after the colleagues, but they also know they get good service. So it, to me, it was just a no brainer. It's just common sense, but it's amazing. Um, it's not that common as Julian often reminds me. Um, so when we were looking at this, we've got, I think we've got, uh, we do the prompt payment code as said, we've always paid suppliers on time. Why wouldn't you? You look after your suppliers and pay them on time. If there's a deal to be had or um, a, some, you know, something that would do, benefit us, you'll always be top of the queue. Um, we've also been using it in negotiations with new suppliers, uh, whether that's uh, our, our sort of mobile phone network or our web agency, the people we use, we've been going to them. If it's new, we're saying we really need you to sign up to this. 
um, or at least have some interest in it. But we use that. It's, it's a really makes a point of difference. And, you know, we want to work with like minded people um, because then you get the same service and as, as you give your own customers. Um, so it's been it, it, it's been really important. But the brilliance of the GBC is the fact it's a one stop shop. So if you can, and once this gains more momentum, and they've done, we've done phenomenal, they've done phenomenally well over the last couple of years. But as it gains more momentum, the dream is that you have a GBC sticker in your window or a logo on your website, and every member of the public will know that that's the place that they can happily put, uh, spend their money or get a service from, and know that everyone behind the scenes is being paid well, looked after, um, and and it's an ethical business. And also the other thing we've noticed more in the last couple of years is the, I hate to say, it cause it makes me sound old, but the younger generation are thinking very much more about their work-life balance. And they want to work in a place where they know they're not gonna be driven into the ground. They know they're gonna be paid fairly and that the, uh, the ethics of the company fits their, the way they think and feel now. And it's, um, I haven't noticed it so much before, but the last two years, there's been a huge in increase in that. Um, and I think it's the right, it's this, the, again, this is a point of differentiation. They can see the 10 things we follow really easily. And as I say, we've got a whole page on our website on the, on the various different things that we do. Um, and again, that gets a lot of traction from people. We notice there's, there's high, high, high hit rates on that page. So we know it's of interest to people. Um, so yeah, I don't know whether I've done my five minutes or I forgot to time myself, but that in a nutshell is why we're so happy to be part of the GBC and, and why we think it's good, not just for our colleagues, but for our customers as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Julie. Hopefully you can see everyone applauding because I can see Francis and Julie applauding, but you just can't hear because we've muted everyone. That's great. Really helpful. And yeah, do take a look at Richard Sound's website. It really is just an effective way to set out what they stand for and what they're accredited to. And yeah, it's, a, it's an easy example to then lift and to put on your own website. The amount of people who don't put it on their website, you know, what's the point of joining if you're not going to tell everyone about it? I'm going to now hand over to Lorne, who is, let me get your Chief Financial and Business Development Officer over at Brompton. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I hope you guys can see, I've got a couple of slides. Hopefully, can you see that? Can someone give me a thumbs up if you can actually see the slides? Let's see if that come through. Yeah, cool. Excellent. So for us, I asked one of my team, this is how it all started. I said, look, can you give me one slide which epitomizes what Brompton is? Funny enough, this is accountant. No, no surprises there. Let's come from an accountant. And this isn't really what I would say what Brompton's all about. I think for Brompton, what I consider us to be about it is this. This is our purpose. It's a bit of Jenny mentioned, as um, Judy mentioned there. The youngs, younger recruitment that we're finding coming through, they want to know more about our purpose, more about what we stand for as a business, what our ethos is, what our sustainability um, standards are within the organization. So we spent a lot of time defining what our purpose is and what we stand for. Just a couple of words there, just sort of pick out. So firstly, the we, you know, we're a collaborative, we're a collective, we're a group, we're a team. And that's why it's really important, the we element. The urban, we, we produce a bike that's mainly used in urban environments. It can be used anywhere, but predominantly it comes into its own in urban environments. And finally, the happier lives. Yeah, our bike helps on health, well-being, environmental, has a positive impacts across the board there, as well as community. So when we do get people coming in for interviews and they're asking about our purpose, it hits them when they actually come through the door. They know what Brompton's all about. And we're seeing this over the last couple of years, real, real shift. Employees are not looking to join a company because purely on pay or on travel. They really want to know what the DNA of the business is all about. So this is really, really important to us. Long can yeah, sure. We can't see the slides actually. Oh, right, okay. It isn't sharing, so. Oh, right, okay, let me just. There we go. Now Is that it. better? Yeah. Oh, right, okay, sorry, let me just go back to our purpose. Um, just, sorry. So this was our accountant slide. So he kind of gave us an overview of what he see Brompton as, but this is what we really stand for as a business. You know, we create urban freedom for happier lives. Our people, they're at the heart of it. You know, when I joined Brompton, we had 80 employees. We're now 800 employees. 
we've really had to adapt how we run the business. Obviously, we've had COVID, we've all had to have hybrid work and sort of into it, but far more than that, you know, we really want our staff to feel engaged. So we've set up a whole series of communities. So we have our, our BAME, our Pride, our Women, our Mental Health, all of these are communities that we've set up, internal communities. We have about 25% of our staff that are all signed up to join that are part of one of these communities and we've got 60 people at the moment over the last two weeks that are trying to actually join one of the communities we vet people before they actually go into one of those communities just to understand what their drivers are so for us as well as having this community aspect we also um having the london living wage also being part of the gbc is helping us to attract sort of staff um and then once we've actually got those staff, develop them. You know, we are investors in people, silver, we're going for platinum. That's next up, we're going for that um, hopefully later this year. But through those community groups as well, they've had a real positive impact on the business. You know, we've enhanced our maternity pay, just listening to the group. So that's from Women's Out. And through the group, they wanted to attend Pride. So as a group, we were listening to those guys and we facilitated that to actually support them. And we're finding staff being far more open about which groups they want to be part of and their views are coming through, whether that's individually or as a collective. But our, our staff feel much more part of the Brompton community off the back of that. Additionally, sustainability is really, really important to us as a business. We've developed our first sustainability stru um, strategy, which developed it around culture, so embedding sustainability into the core of our business our planet, setting science-based targets, our people establishing programs to protect our supply chain and activism, you know, using business for a force of good. You know, you, we have to make profit. It's, what, it's one of the part of the three Ps and you have to make profit to be able to invest, to do more good. And that's as a business what we're trying to do. We've now set up our own sustainability team internally. So we have a team that purely 100% focused on sustainability. We do a lot of shared knowledge. So I was in Burberry earlier this week, learning from them as to how they capture key metrics and also embed sustainability in the old organization. And it's a bit like, as I mentioned earlier, with regards to recruitment and retention of our staff, it's being demanded of us as an employer. And we are knee deep at the moment of transforming Brompton into a B Corp. Um, we have our AGM in three weeks time where we're open for some, where we will get approval to move Brompton to a B Corp. And that was led from feedback from our staff. They wanted us to move in this direction. Our customers assumed that we actually had it already, but we actually didn't. But we've got a lot of the um, groundwork in place. But we think it's a good representation, B Corp, as to what we are as a business. And it represents what we stand for. So um, people, sustainability, it's how we develop our people, bringing sustainability into the organization. These are two real key areas as we develop our business that it's just being asked for more and more from um, current employees and also um, potential employees. Our ambition as we go forward, so this is our new factory that we've just got in for planning permission on. This is a 100 acre, 80 of those acres will be remain as wetland where we're gonna develop that for, for nature reserves. Within the 20 acres we're developing, it'll be across three sites eventually, but we're looking to employ over a thousand people all locally, partnering with local university, local colleges, and we'd be looking for educational programs, whether someone wants a spanner in their hand or a calculator in their hand. It would be completely cross-functional of how we develop the future for Brompton and the future employees that we want, and we're going to be capturing them far younger and getting into colleges and schools and we've been devoting a large chunk of that factory as educational suites as well so we can bring people into the organization and make those youngsters see that yeah, manufacturing isn't a, a dirty word where it's all everybody's covered in mud and mud and dirt and sort of go out covered in grime we want them to be inspired the future generation and for them to be inspired we need to create a factory that will inspire them so um that's where we're investing going forward that's it. Thank you, guys. That's great. Thanks, Lauren. It's good to get a perspective from a different organisation working in a very different, well, working in manufacturing, as you say, with uh, with some of the you know, challenges around that. So that's great. And uh, interestingly, a question just come in. We'll get to questions shortly. Uh, just 
looking in at the larger and the smaller and we really wanted to make sure that the smaller businesses were also represented in these little content sets we're doing here and so I am delighted to welcome Erin from The Trampery. Perhaps you can explain what The Trampery is, Erin, as part of your introduction to how what the GBC has meant for you as a business. Absolutely and thank you Jenny. Uh, so for those who don't know us yet, the Trampery is a purpose-led enterprise and we're dedicated to making business a positive force in society, aren't we all? So the way we do it is through the provision of workspaces, venues, training and management services in pursuit of our mission. Um, and so we've been operating since 2009. We now have six amazing workspaces, which combines kind of maker spaces, studios, workspace manufacturing suites, predominantly across the north and southeast of London. Uh, plus business training for inclusivity and impact, which includes accelerator programs for early stage entrepreneurs, as well as corporate training on anti-racism, allyship, diversity and inclusion. So one of the key things that really attracted us to the Good Business Charter was the fact that our mission feels very aligned. So our mission is five key components. Uh, the first is to advance business models with positive social and environmental impact. Second, to support entrepreneurs from underrepresented backgrounds. Three, to drive inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And four, to promote healthy work-life balance and well-being. And number five, contribute to thriving neighborhoods and strong communities. So that's why we fell in love with a good business charter. We're, we're very much in sync. And in addition, it was a really straightforward process. Uh, we were already working towards most of their objectives if we hadn't achieved them already. Uh, it was affordable as a social enterprise. This was key to us. We needed something that we could afford, but we could also roll out to another, like a whole heap of our early stage entrepreneurs. And importantly, it offered us a network and community of like-minded businesses who are also on a similar journey. Um, choosing to be a better business can present a really unique set of challenges and having a sounding board has been hugely valuable. One of our key organizational goals is that in the next five years, 75% of our members, our partners, contractors, and suppliers will also be purpose-led businesses, social enterprises, or charities. Um, and so we've been using the Good Business Charter as a tool to try and help our wider community and network adopt these better practices. So earlier this year, we launched the Good Business Event Series, which focused on a number of the key components. So we would bring in experts, some of them from the Good Business Charter network themselves, to come in and speak to not just our members, but also the wider community, to our partners or suppliers and to like people in the local area um, on the kind of topics that were really of interest to them, while also informing them about the different components that were available and how they could sign up. So from mental health, gut health and mindfulness, when we're speaking about employee well-being, from women in business to LGBTQIA plus inclusion to neurodiversity in the workplace, we were bringing in experts to talk about all of these different topics, both to upskill us as an organization, but also everyone in our community. Um, and through hosting these regular talks and networking events for our members in the wider community, we've been able to tap into some amazing experts and some amazing speakers. A little shout out to Total Wellbeing Matters, who I met at one of these networking events earlier this year. Um, and as a result, we've seen partner organizations sign up. So again, a big shout out to City Gateway, uh, who came to one of our first events and immediately saw that this was something that they love to our members who are currently exploring the individual components. Um, so we've got about 500 members across our six different workspaces, as well as alumni and program participants. So we've got an amazing reach of really interesting and diverse businesses. And so it's a really great way for us to kind of show them an easy tool that they can adopt and embed into their business from, from the beginning. Um, and we've started introducing the good business components as we expand our work to other areas. Uh, so we're looking at workspaces now in West and Southwest London. Um, and it was really great to have Jenny come and speak to our Kingston Good Business events earlier this year. So we're looking forward to using Good Business Charter um, as a tool to learn, support more of our partner members and businesses to adopt better business practices in the future. And we also just want to work with more of the GBC members. Um, this is an amazing opportunity to get to know businesses all around the country who are all doing similar and very different things, um, but all with the same purpose. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share our experience as a small organization. Uh, feel free to get in touch and come visit our spaces in London. Thanks. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you everyone uh, so much uh, for that. What a, in 45 minutes, what an incredible tour de force. Um, and I think there are some big highlights and messages that certainly jumped out at me. I think the imperative for this was really clear. Um, Julian talked about the, uh, this being the hallmark of being a leading business. The imperative for it in terms of that clamor that's out there in the country for good, decent work that pays well. 
But critically, I think the point that Tony made that, you know, this is a big opportunity. You know, there is a big push towards a greener, fairer economy and being at the front of that and business leaders being at the front of that is absolutely key. Um, I think I'm going to steal Joel's uh, phrase, responsibility isn't a cost to a business, but a huge opportunity. I think if we remember nothing else, that sums it up and that sums up why, why we're all here. Um, but it does require that shift in the business model, uh, which we heard about. Um, but the upside of that is customers are increasingly expecting this of their businesses, and it is a differentiator. It is something that defines the good, the excellent, and that will have an impact on the bottom line. But there's also that part around staff engagement, that sense that actually there's a generation of workers that take pride, that take confidence in businesses that put this at the heart of their culture. Um, and if there's, we've got a phrase to stick in our mind, an image is that image of the clean factory um, from Brompton Bicycles, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And I can imagine a world where that is the sort of economy, that's the sort of businesses, that's the sort of factories that we see coming forward. Um, and then the sort of final key point I would make is spread the word. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the example uh, that we were given from Aaron of actually, this is not just about out within the business, but actually taking it to your suppliers and your partners so that we create that movement, so that we create that momentum. And this becomes the norm that we all see. So I'm hugely cheered, I'm encouraged, I'm inspired by everything that everyone has contributed. We've got um, some time for questions. Uh, within our formal session, we've got uh, 15 minutes, but we didn't want to cut it off short. So I think if people want to stay on and ask further questions, Julian and Jenny have very kindly said that they will stay on to answer so that we have this conversation. But it feels that we're at the start of something and this feels like the beginning of what I hope will not just be many meetings to come as our masses and our numbers grow, uh, but at the very front of a different way of how we do the economy and business. Jenny, you are going to take us through the final part of the session um, as we sort of hopefully have got a swathe of questions that have come in. Yep, thank you, Miata, that was great. Um, sort of organising questions, there's a few sort of more operational ones which I will pick up. So I'm going to start with, from the top down really, I'm going to take Paul your question. So Paul said just this week the UK government reiterated they want to keep the ban on public bodies considering corporate conduct in their procurement considerations. This covers 300 billion of spend per annum. Do the panel agree that this is mad and a massive missed opportunity to drive forward and reward good business practice? Anyone want to make a comment on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what a missed opportunity, what a missed opportunity. But that is something I think that will change big time. And, um, you know, we know that that whole issue of outsourced contracts in particular is really, really important and really important for women workers and black and ethnic minority workers who are far more likely to be, you know, a long way down those chains and where you can make most difference. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we've got to use what levers we can, and procurement is a massive one. Thank you, Francis. Anyone else wanted to add anything to that? No, I will whip past these quickly. So the other big kind of level... I think Joel was going to jump in. Okay. Oh, you're on mute, Joel. I, I was just going to add it's um, it's clearly a missed opportunity in terms of many of the social and employment factors, but I think as well it's a massive missed opportunity in terms of environmentally enhancing our society, you know, the procurement chain, most businesses in many sectors will find that 70 plus percent of the emissions associated with a business are to do with their supply chain, and if you can't be helping and doing things to enforce good practices through procurement and downstreaming things, we'll never hit our ambitions for net zero as a society. So I wholly concur with Francis. This is a massive missed opportunity. Great. Thanks, Joel. The other big sort of high level question is around, there's a question about what about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and then also the relationship of or how it might evolve with B Corps. And obviously, Lorne did reference Brompton um, becoming B Corps. So yeah, you know, I'm conscious I can give a view, but I would maybe see uh, who else on the panel might want to 
reference into either of those things first? I'm, I'm happy to jump in if you want, Jen. Just for a minute on B course. So first of all, make it quite clear, we absolutely applaud anyone on the stage with us. Uh, anyone trying to improve uh, responsible business and, and encourage it, we absolutely applaud it. We see them as quite different to us. They've been around a lot longer than us. Um, we see them as a really helpful uh, self-auditing improvement function. Um, as far as I understand it, you can join with less than 100%, but they want to help you get to 100%. So it's not a black and white accreditation system like ours. Again, as I understand it, it's more of a progression. Uh, it, it's much more complex to join. We tried to join once and it took us quite a while and we, we didn't get to the end of it. And it's also a lot more expensive because you get much more, uh, you know, they're providing much more support and service. So um, this is not a criticism of them. We absolutely love them. We speak to them and, uh, uh, and we talk together and, and see if we can do stuff together. But we, we are quite different. Just want to make that clear. So a lot of our members will, will be members of, of, of B Corp and we, that's, we're not competing with them and suggesting you leave them. Uh, but we're just different. And people often ask, what is the difference? Why are you both out there? Uh, and, and that's my take on it. I don't know, Jen, you, is that where you're coming from? Yeah, I think obviously B Corp is global and anything that any changes they're doing in the process of a big consultation at the moment will take a long time to process through because it's at a global level. And we felt that the UK consumer and the UK employee wanted a really clear way to see what businesses are doing and how they're being responsible. And the reality is it's 10 minimum standards that they have to meet and therefore that makes it very clear. So that's kind of where we're, we're coming in. We're also in communication with the other charters. So Greater Manchester Charter, West Yorkshire developing there. So, you know, we want to be sort of aware of what each other are doing and look at where there are opportunities to do things together or, or look at how our members can be advised on different areas as well. But as June said, we're, we're, we're very different in, in kind of where we're coming from and the way that we're set up. We find it complementary, actually. We think they can complement each other quite well. And um, we think having BCOT just, it, it's, it's different, but there is complementary. So we, yeah, for us, having both is definitely where we want to say We've really benefited from the GBC. That's really, really helped us. We're finding now we're also getting employees. Who, and I just think the sustainability element with BCOT, we've got a lot of it there already. It's just fine tuning what we have. So for us, they both work, fit together perfectly. Brilliant, thanks. So I think we, we used to think we were the sort of starter, the entry point, and then you'd go on from there. But in conversations with Chris Turner at B Corp, he has acknowledged that some B Corp uh, certified organisations, the next step for them is a GBC because they don't pay the real living wage or, or something like that. So it really is uh, different aspects that are being emphasised. As far as the sustainable development goals are, we haven't done a full mapping exercise, but clearly the GBC is responding to some of those. Uh, you know, I would say that we are responding to them all in different ways, but um, I know a lot of businesses are using those as a framework and we would just say, well, the GBC is it's about that framework to the consumer and the general public who want a really clear way to understand how businesses are being responsible, uh, which is how we've focused in really. Um, I don't know, Miasha, have you got anything to share on the SDGs or? Um... No, but I mean, I think part of the challenge is how you crystallise those into really tangible, clear ways that mean something for businesses and that can be operationalised. Um, and actually, I think we've got quite far in doing that um, through our 10 components. And I think when we started, it was always clear that this was a journey and that we'd look to build on it, but actually getting those core things right and getting them to be seen as a hallmark of what it means to be a sustainable, good business that looks after your people and looks after your customers. This was a really practical way in which we could do it. And I think we've done that pretty well. And the question for me is like how we move forward in the years to come so that we have alignment to those wider SDG goals. Brilliant, thank you. So there's a couple of questions around. So Sarah asked, how can we all support each other better as a community of good business? And then there was a question from Jen saying, what can sole traders do to uphold the values of the GBC with no employees and supply chain? I guess I'd widen all those to, to how, and this is something we certainly want to, to build more really, is how can we as a community, not just support one another, but keep getting the word out, as, as Miata said there, spread the word. So I don't know if any of our businesses that shared have any particular uh, nuggets that they think would be good to share, um, but we're, we're all ears as well. <laughs> can I pick on Aaron as well, because I think you've done so much work um, in this space, it'd be brilliant to give some top tips to others. Yeah, so I think 
one of the big things that we've done as an organization is to review our suppliers. Uh, where we spend our money is where we make the most impact. Um, and so by basically pulling in the list of GBC organizations when we've been looking for suppliers, it's been a really useful tool to find people who are experts in that area. Um, so I think more of that is really useful. The monthly meetups have also proven great at like getting experts in individual components because they think that no one's going to be top in all 10. People are going to have individual strengths and experiences. Um, and also as a smaller organization of less than 30 employees, our experience is going to be different from the kind of bigger organizations. So being able to share at a similar level is also quite helpful. Um, but I think that obviously, you know, we've got the logo on our website, we've got like the sticker and our buildings, but being able to bring people together has always been the, the biggest way of finding those kind of connections. And even at the last kind of good business event that we hosted, we managed to get a new member of staff who'd come along for the content and was just really excited about what we were doing as an organization. There's loads of really organic ways that we can kind of work together, I think, if if there's a will to kind of bring everyone on, on the journey with them. That's brilliant. Uh, there's a question just coming about any plans to come together physically. You know, I think for us, we're in a situation where we want to hear from our accredited organisations. And yes, you know, definitely we think, well, if people would like to gather, you know, have our annual gathering next year be physical, then we're all for it. But we want to make sure that we're listening to people and only putting on things as a small team. Again, we don't want to put on things that no one's going to come to. So actually later this month, we are going to send a survey out to all our accredited organisations because it's a moment before next year to kind of think, what do people want to attend? What will be useful? So that's going to be really important. So do, do answer that when it drops into your inbox, please. Um, and I just say for the sole traders as well, we do have a lot of sole traders that have accredited and they've been delighted to be able to be involved. And really you are connecting with other businesses. You are, you've got clients. And if everyone, if all of our members were to convince another five organisations to join, you know, we wouldn't it be amazing by next year to have 5,000 organisations. So it really is about looking at all the different ways that we can get this down our supply chain, out to our clients and customers, um, and, and just get people excited about it, talking about it, which does lead into a question from Jeremy. Do we have a group that allows people to share ideas? Uh, we use Slack internally. Um, so that is the place at the moment that we've got set up. Again, we're totally open to suggestions on different ways we can do that. And a question about social media, uh, we are, you know, there's a lot more we could do. And I think a focus for us is what do we focus, what do we do and, and do well? Our social media, we, we have a presence on all the main channels. Uh, the person who was managing our social media is no longer with us. So my colleague Sam has picked that up, but we are, you know, looking at what's the right way because we, our sense and from researching uh, in this area, the best way that we are going to grow and develop is from our own membership, talking about it, shouting about it, and actually you guys doing it and us just amplifying your voice is always going to be the most effective way. Um, so in so many ways, it's over to you and we need you to be champions. So uh, I think I might have picked up the main ones. Any literature advertised GBC was part of that. So as you're going out to exhibitions, Yes, I've picked them up from the uh, from my windowsill. So at the moment, we've only got little A5 leaflets. Uh, we've got post banners, but, you know, we're trying to balance that sustainability with leaflets. So we don't want to just, you know, I haven't got massive boxes. I just print a few at a time. Uh, but yes, if you obviously when we when you join, you get a membership pack with your stickers. Uh, but we do want to um, resource you for the things that you can do. So just talk to us. And if you want some leaflets that you're going to an exhibition, yes, yes, the answer is yes, please, yes, just get the word out, get the brand out. Uh, you know, we can't do a huge amount on our own as a small team, but with all of us doing it, we'll, we'll keep that momentum going. Um, I'm a member of the business owner, but charities were mentioned earlier. As a trustee of a small charity in York, might membership for them be appropriate? Julian, do you want to say a word about charities and your heart for that? Yeah, we, we <laughs> so obviously they've got slightly different components. We take out the, the, the tax element for charities and the public sector, but, you know, they're employing people and we want them to treat their people well. And I've given talks at several well-known charities where they're interested to hear what we're doing. And the only difference is the profit motive. 
and therefore the tax isn't isn't a component. But um, uh, of course, I have an interest in in workers generally uh, being treated well, and also customer service. I don't tell you, you know, we we support several hundred charities, and uh, sometimes very frustrating it is too when we don't get good service in return as we're trying to help them. But um, uh, generally, they're very good and, and working very hard. I don't I don't be critical of the whole charity sector, but we we wanted them to feel welcome and to get involved in this debate, and to if we can teach them stuff or or you know they can see what we're doing in the business world, we think that's a good thing. So um, I think we've had some good interest, haven't we, from the member side? Uh, we have, and I think conversation with charities, you can find some charities that do amazing stuff, but actually they're not doing the best by their employees. So actually sure. there's, there's a message there for charities to join. And uh, there was also a question previously about educational institutions. Yes, got a few universities on board and totally want schools, colleges, universities, because yes, it's about how you're treating your workforce. Um, I'm conscious it's just gone 12 o'clock Mieta, so we probably ought to uh, have just rounded it off at that stage. Perfect. Uh, at least for those who need to get away. Perfect. Brilliant. We have gone through a huge amount. Um, I will just say a massive thank you to Jenny uh, for both uh, the work and bringing us all together today, but actually the incredible, phenomenal work that you've been doing uh, yeah. to bring this all uh, together to get us to over a thousand members. Uh, the amount of commitment, the dedication, um, all with a smile is quite impressive uh, to see. Uh, to close us all off, uh, I think the final thing I'd say for me is please, the big message is spread the word. Uh, tell your support plus tell your partners and if we can sign up more people let's have that target of being over 5,000 by the time we meet up next year um I will hand over to Julian uh who sort of started us off just to close us off and say uh goodbye yeah well, it's been amazing it's so just working with such great people passionate enthusiastic people to have you all on board and joining us today as well giving up your time in a busy day when business is so tough I mean we're all we'll all find it the same I, I would still believe what we're what we're doing is, is giving us a really good competitive advantage. So it is a real opportunity and uh, uh, just really grateful, really exciting times. And, uh, you know, let's make this dream happen of getting more and more uh, people signed up and consumers aware and, and keep perpetuating this, this virtual circle, hopefully will carry on and grow. Huge thanks to everybody. Thanks a lot.